Welcome back to the Rate of Change with York Wealth Management. As advised, it's to some of the wealthiest families in the country. The Rate of Change is a podcast designed to help you in the pursuit of building long-term wealth through the insights of some of the brightest minds in asset management. I'm your host, Murdoch Gaddy, and in today's broadcast, we're speaking with Vince Bazzullo, Head of Australian Equities at Perpetual, about his outlook for Aussie equities, uh, gearing, and activist ownership investing was founded in 1886 and is one of Australia's oldest oldest financial services and asset managers. The Aussie equities part of the business manages roughly $12 billion. And today we are discussing the Australian share fund, the geared Australian share fund, which mimics the previously mentioned Aussie shares fund and is leveraged at two to one and their strategic capital fund, which was launched back end of last year. For me, I really enjoyed hearing Vince discuss the activist um, investment fund, the, the new fund which they have, and in particular, how they go in, speak with these businesses, purchase up, uh, purchase a percentage of the company, and then go to improve the business uh, inside out to improve shareholder value. And in, And one thing I found very interesting was how he mentions that aligning the right remuneration packages in the business is probably one of the easiest ways to create this long-lasting positive change um, and shareholder return. Also, if you're wondering how the new weight loss drug, like a Zempic, Novo Nordisk, Eli Lilly, may impact Australia's healthcare sector, or you just keep hearing about it being discussed at the barbecue, then I think you're going to enjoy uh, Vince's uh, insights on uh, what has happened in this space and the impact on uh, various Australian companies in the healthcare sector, such as Regismed, CSL, and more. Today, we discuss many companies, uh, Vince Unpacks, uh, Blue Scope Steel, Aluka, Woolworths, Flutter Entertainment, Goodman Group, a French company, which I can't pronounce, but it's brilliant, IAG, CSL, ResMed, Nova Nordist, Eli Lilly, and more. Before we get into the conversation, please remember this podcast is made for entertainment purposes only and not to be construed as any form of advice. I encourage you to listen to the disclaimer at the end of this podcast and to keep your feedback coming. You can reach me at mgaddy at ywm.com.au. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So sit back, relax, and enjoy it. Vince Bazzullo, welcome to the Rate of Change with York Wealth Management. Oh, okay, going. Good. Really, really well, thanks. Um, so, Vince, uh, you've been in the market a long time. Uh, how did you get into the market? Uh, it's not really getting into the market. You sort of, uh, almost by osmosis. You, it's, it's, when I was about 13, 14, you know, the, the newspaper, the section where it had all the stock prices, I thought it was Fascinating seeing all these letters and numbers after them. What the hell are they? So um, started reading those every day, having a look, trying to understand what that all meant. Then started trying to pick up as much information as I can, um, go to the library, get, get some annual reports out of the library, have a look at those. I don't know what that meant either. Um, so then you start to develop a bit of an inf- uh, The information starts to build. Your interest starts to peak. Um, and it's just it's it's a constant uh, uh, flow of of trying to work out where you're going to go. You know, when you're that young, you're trying to work out what career you want to have. Maybe it's at fifteen, sixteen. Most people don't have that yet. But I was pretty clear I wanted to go work in investing somehow or in the markets and investing. I don't know which part though. I didn't know where I was going. So um, it's still uh, an un, untrodden path I was going to go down. Uh, for me personally. So, and, you know, I come from a different background. My family are not in the financial markets or any of that. So um, they're all, you know, in building trade, as you'd expect, or um, et cetera. So I was going down all on my own and trying to have a crack at that, having a crack that way. Um, and then you just meet a few people. They help you out sometimes. They uh, give you, tell you, you should probably do this first. And then that, etc., and and that that's you get a lot of help if you if you really show a bit of interest in something, 
uh, and you put the effort in, the people will always recognise that and they'll give you a uh, helping hand occasionally. So um, then I got into economics and finance at uni and I was on my way then. And, but I was working at the same time, so I was working at night and I was doing um, uh, some currency trading at night. Um, and that was very different. And then um, in the mid-'90s, I answered an ad about this big in the Sydney Morning Herald. There was no such thing as Seek back then. Uh, and there was a, a job to go to work for the State Superannuation Board of New South Wales, State Super, it was called, because they had an internalised, tell you how this is full circle, an internalised uh, management team, portfolio management team. So they had a full team internally, and I worked in the global team first. I was covering um, UK and continental Europe sectors. I knew absolutely nothing. Um, so I was 100% vertical learning curve. and um, I had, a good, I had a good boss there at the time. His name was Rob Prugay, and there was a good team of international investors. Tom Cotton was the chief investment officer at the time, and he sort of like modernised the team there, like brought it up to, um, you know, I hate to say the 20th century, not 21st century, but um, that was, it was an interesting period to go through that where they changed their the philosophy actually was developed at State Super, and they had an Aussie equity team as well at the time, but I was in the, the global team at the time. So it took that period, that was like six or seven years. Um, I was, State Super eventually corporatized their investment management business and sold it to um, Deutsche Bank, actually. It was Morgan Grenfell at the time, but Deutsche Morgan Grenfell, which is an offshore fund manager. And they took that money overseas to their teams overseas and I, I moved over into the Australian equities team in small caps. And then I was there for about 11 years at that time. And then basically in 2007, um, uh, the Australian equity business was sold to Aberdeen Asset Management in Australia. Uh, Deutsche sold it. And I uh, took the opportunity to take a redundancy at the time, particularly because the tax rates were really good. Um, so uh, I, uh, I left not thinking, knowing where I was going to go, but Within a fortnight, I got contacted from someone at Perpetual that I'd met 12 months earlier. Um, you know, Emilio Gonzalez was there at the time as chief investment officer. And one or two, but I knew some of the analysts at, and the PMs at, uh, at Perpetual at the time. Because uh, you see them in the markets, you go to same meetings, et cetera. Um, and uh, they offered me a role in the Australian equities team. And I started, started in basically May, June 2007, just before the GFC. And I was covering the, or they asked me to cover the banks. And I was managing money at, at State Super, but you got to go back two steps sometimes to go forward. And I didn't consider it to go backwards because Perpetual's a recognised business and they've got a great track record in asset management. So to get into the Perpetual business, I, th I took it as this is a great opportunity and you're going to have to prove yourself again. And that's what life's about, right? Continually just trying to prove yourself. And um, I covered the banks and... <laughs> Banks, uh, some of the industrials, REITs, etc. Uh, and I was looking at some of those non-banks, some of the high, high, and fly, uh, high and mighty type stocks like Babcock and Brown and Alco and all these things that basically went to God after the GFC. Um, that was an exciting period going through that. Um, but you learned. I learned a lot. Again, you get these moments, you know, tech wreck. You get these moments in markets where they're, they're signposts to tell you. <laughs> be ready to learn something because things are about to change and these are the errors that everyone's making. This group think that you're seeing is actually, you've got to be very wary of it and just try and recognise the signals if you can. It's hard when you're in it um, to, to spot those signals. But, um, yeah, so then I started managing money at Perpetual about 2014 um, Industrial Share Fund. Uh, started running that. Then moved through the business. Uh, Launched the PIC as well, the Perpetual Equity Investment Company. It's an LIC. Um, and uh, today I run a few funds. Uh, now I'm the head of equities at Perpetual. Um, and the philosophy, the more importantly, the philosophy and the process from when I started, the people I knew before at Perpetual, it's, it's very consistent. And that's the reason you join Perpetual is that the culture is well-defined. Uh, the philosophy is well-defined and it doesn't flex. Right, the philosophy is what it is. The way we invest is very strict. Um, what is the philosophy? 
So we're like, we focus on quality and value. So um, there'll be times in the cycle where you're probably a little bit more exposed to quality businesses where, you know, typically um, the cycle the cycle's very extended. You, you feel like you're getting close to the peaks. The economy is probably running a little hot and you're going to start to see some um, uh, some weakness or a policy response to slow things down, et cetera, all those sort of things, those markers you look for. And at that point, the quality part of the market will typically hold up better, typically. But then there'll be a point where, um, you know, you get yield curves start to steepen, et cetera. You want to be exposed to value, right? Uh, and you want to be a little bit contrarian in that point because you need to move into value well before the market recognises that you need to be in value. So we have this, this element of trying to uh, pay the right price for quality when it's available. When you get a really great company, occasionally, and I think the, the COVID sort of fleshed that out a bit, you had really good companies like trade down 50% and on a look-through basis, they're trading on very low multiples. And that was an opportunity to really high-grade your portfolio and take some risk in really good companies that you couldn't buy before because they're just trading too expensive. Uh, the, the valuations were way out there. Uh, but at that time, uh, if I was just focus on COVID a bit, um, you did see these hugely contrarian opportunities in the market. Like you saw assets trade below replacement value, businesses trade below replacement value during COVID, which was as long as their balance sheets were okay. And going through that period, you sort of sat there and went, there's probably going to be a capital raising for some of these companies. We want to be around to participate because it'll be done at a very, very cheap multiple. Um, and it's hard to do because you don't want, it's, things are looking ugly at the time. But that, these are, as I said, through that period, I've been through a few cycles in that period. Um, you try to recognise, you try and keep your alert to some of the signals, but every cycle is completely different. The main area is exactly the same, though, you start to see. Well, it's good that we started off, uh, you know, straight into it. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, since you know, normally there's a process about you know you know how we do these conversations, but I just love the fact of uh, what you were saying, and may as well just jump right into it. And what I mean by this is, I've had a number of conversations with um, you know very high end um, uh, asset managers like yourself, Vince, and what I'm starting to see is a pattern forming um, where, as you mentioned. Funny money pushed everything up. Valuations didn't make sense. Huge amount of money went in. You know, everyone felt rich at the wrong time at the wrong prices. It just makes no sense. We've seen that shake out. And what's really interesting, wouldn't you agree, is now assets potentially look better than they've ever looked. But people are feeling poor and are finding it very, very difficult to um, justify, you know, going and supporting a company which they've, you know, done a, ra- a fundraise round previously, even when the asset prices are potentially like half or even, you know, lower than what they went into before. Um, you know, people should be greedy when others are fearful to an extent. And what, uh, you know, and the other thing which I'm hearing a lot is a number of these excellent small or value businesses can barely catch a bid. And um, why this is quite topical, I believe last night uh, in the US, this is recorded on the 28th of March, we just hit all-time highs. It hit, broke out, what, 40,000? And then today, then the market set to open in 12 minutes. That's potentially going to set another all-time high. Mm-hmm. So the question, uh, which is, I suppose, is on everyone's mind, is we're literally at all-time highs. And whenever you're looking at a technical chart, you know, is it is it a situation where we should be considering taking profit here, like you're talking about before, or is this just some companies that have driven this up, like the Magnificent Seven? Meanwhile, the underbelly, all these companies are looking potentially healthier than ever and barely even moved. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because it looks like a two-speed economy, but I'd love to hear what you're saying. Well, um, if you look at the US, the actual Magnificent 7 hasn't done too much in the last few months. They've actually been pretty stagnant, if not down a little bit. So you have seen a bit of rotation out of those into a broader part of the market. Um, I guess there is this expectation of going from a, a soft, hard landing, soft landing to now the market sort of probably trying to uh, deal with a no landing situation uh, so that things just muddle through in the economy and you don't see much slow down. But then people have to sort of, the market has baked in two to three cuts this year. You could be, look, you also got to throw in 
the fact that we're going to be in an election cycle in the US as well. And that sort of, sort of throw things around as well. You'll get quite a few policy statements. Um, you know, we're in an age of fiscal dominance at the moment. So running significant deficit financing, you know, when governments run deficits, they're basically dissaving and they're giving the money to the private sector to go spend and use as they see fit. Uh, that tends to keep things going. I think the US government's the, and Biden administration has announced a pretty significant fiscal uh, expansion again. Um, so, you know, they've got central banks sitting there trying to keep a lid on inflation. And the problem we've got by the time we get to the end of this, let's say, say the end of this year, uh, the, the inflation will start comping weaker numbers. So you could actually see inflation start to stabilise and go back up uh, if we don't see more prevalent softness in the broad, like the economy, the, any, there's pockets of weakness in, in the economy. Like Australia's obvious, right? You've got um, housing construction's weak, weakening, but rents are going up at twice inflation, right? So that's a, that's the simple thing of supply versus stock. There is no stock being built because because rates are high and developers can't get lending and banks are tightening lending standards for developers and you get you know you get this cycle spinning through the economy and it's it's incongruous to think that things are strong uh, but housing's weak Act, housing activity is weak and then you got the reserve bank sitting there going um, we're not ruling anything in or out so they could raise and they may cut so it's a, it's a fascinating period right it's hard to think about that so what the markets do is they will go the path of least resistance and you've seen um, financial conditions, so, you know, effectively ease to access to money um, has improved since basically November last year. And you can basically track that to the movement in the market. You've seen a pretty significant uh, easing of financial conditions and that's filtered its way through to uh, assets, financial assets. Uh, but it does feel like... Um, because none of us have experienced a blow off in inflation, uh, that everyone's assuming we're going to go back to pre nineteen, pre COVID. Sorry, maybe that's the case. But I think there's significant amounts of price power still in the corporate sector, uh, and commodities have rolled off a little bit. That helps. Uh, Labor's had a pretty strong year last year. Labor rates going up, wage rates, and. They need to start rolling off. That will give provide. I think they'll provide a bit of benefit in the next twelve to eighteen months. But you still have this issue of marrying that up again to what you're paying for the value of the company. Um, and I still think uh, you've got to be a little bit more conservative now because uh, there is that, that sense of FOMO right now, and we tend you want to be a bit more have a bit of patience. And, and just wait, you will get an opportunity. Like you said, though, there are pockets in the market now where they're smaller companies, no one's interested in them. Uh, the earnings have gone probably backwards for good reason uh, and they're trading pretty cheaply. Some the fit, some have had already, you know, one or two capital raisings. That's a bit of the, you know, catching the falling knife sort of attitude. Uh, but if you're buying those things today, they're the ones that are going to probably deliver you alpha uh, in the next 12 to 18 months rather than buy the, the high flyers today, I think. Yeah, I'm saying that quite a bit, uh, quite a bit. Well, why don't we, why don't we just unpack um, the three funds uh, which you operate in? So you've got the Australian fund, which isn't geared, and then you've got the perpetual Australian geared fund. So why don't we begin there? Why do you mind giving a, a bit of colour around, uh, you know, what's in the portfolios, how they, how they operate, sure. and the how the gearing works with one of the funds, so that'd be great. So the geared fund basically uh, mimics the Australian share fund. So we've got the Australian share fund, which has been around for, you know, 20 odd plus years. Um, and that's basically a, a portfolio between 40 to 55 type uh, stocks. Uh, also though, the Australian, that fund can go up to um, the 20% offshore, that product. Uh, and um, they, we started that, I think that was done in 06, 07, I think, to give a bit more uh, flexibility to the portfolio managers. And, and we do use that occasionally. Um, as you know, what's in the fund, uh, Murdoch, you've seen the, what's, what positions and two of the biggest positions are offshore. Um, People, unfortunately, don't have a PDF in front of them. So, um, no, so <laughs> do, you want to, 
Do you, yeah, do you so want to give it a bit of color around what's in the portfolio and specifically yeah. what comprises that 20% international? Yeah, so we got we don't use – I've traditionally not gone above about 10% in this strategy um, it, because it gives you just enough uh, extra uh, – you're taking more risk, obviously. Um, it is a benchmark sort of quasi-aware product, but not really. We don't run – Looking at the benchmark and saying, "Oh, we, I want to own that because I have to," because bench uh, BHP is ten percent of the index, I have to own it. Uh, we try not to do that. Uh, try to get people to get have a lot of EDS and credit risk, have a lot of stock risk in the portfolio, rather than so have our ideas in the portfolio, rather than oh, the benchmark's got twenty five percent in banks, so we're going to make sure we have enough banks so we don't take any risk, real risk. Uh, but in this one, we've got Flutter. We've had that for a while. Uh, that's done quite well for us. That's the uh, global sport uh, online sports bookmaker. Uh, obviously, they own Sportsbet in Australia, Paddy Power in the UK, etc. And they own FanDuel in the US, and they're in India. They're a bit everywhere, right? So, do you mind fleshing that out a bit? Because a lot of people I'm finding are starting to start hearing about Flutter, and a lot yep. of people just aren't aware of it. But my understanding, Flutter just don't own some of it. They practically nearly dominate half the entire global market. Mm. So is that right? Yeah, they're they're pretty dominant in Australia. I think they're close to fifty percent share here. Uh, yeah, and that's you know they bought a few one or two businesses and they've just they're very good at what they do. They that's all they do. They're not um, they don't have moved across from another any other business. This is in their DNA. When you speak to management, it's in their DNA. Uh, they think that way. So they're, they're a point I feel that because it's a global business. You know, it's pricing risk. They're basically pricing risk and putting odds out there and trying to understand how um, the market's reacting to every sort of every minute that time passes in a, in a, a game. That, that odds are changing, they're pricing that, etc. And they've got a global business to be able to do that. If you're just one business in Australia trying to do that, you know, good luck. Um, they've got multiple markets in multiple, com- uh, multiple countries to be able to, uh, develop that intelligence. So uh, they have uh, invested quite a bit in their tech stack. Uh, it's not about tech though. It's about how you run the business and their attitude towards their customers. Uh, they, they don't they don't try to tr- go after the big VIP customer. That's not their game. Uh, they leave that to others. Um, but they've uh, every time they go into a market, it's they invest a lot into that market. They have a, a basic way they approach their market development and product development, and they are, you know, the part, you know, same game parlays. That's them. They come up with that product actually in Australia, I think. So uh, they've got great product development as well. So they've moved into the US. They bought a business uh, uh, of sort of basically a private equity group several years ago called FanDuel, which is a fantasy football business. No gambling, obviously. It's just me versus you, um, and a bit of uh, ego. So uh, they lucked out there because event because online you could only really put a bet on in Vegas in on sports. The rest was technically illegal, um, but they changed the law uh, so you could have online uh, bookmaking in the US, and that changed everything. And then it's basically a state by state proposition in the US. Every state has their own sports betting uh, laws, and they're slowly opening up um they've been opening up for the last two years two and a half years and they're there with a great brand fan deal with some customers already in it uh once they turn 18 they can gamble um and they've just executed flawlessly on that and they're the basic number one sports book in the us now they've basically got between 40 and 50 percent share i believe so in some in most of their markets and it's very effective uh at uh um, developing their business and they play the long game. Too many companies. No, it's, it's a it's a good business model. I play I play fantasy. Uh, you know, Premier League. And we're about to finish yeah. the season. That thing is addictive. Um, but I've read I've read the articles because we've seen a lot of this space. Uh, you know, uh, with a number of other companies because there's a consolidation play happening in the gambling space. Uh, I've read a couple of the articles that the the probability that if a kid or someone underage starts, you know, playing fantasy. There's a high probability that they're, they're going to potentially gamble on the football games um, in a later stage of life at least once or twice. So it's just essentially vertical integration. 
Look, I think you've got to also pull apart that Aussies tend to gamble anyway. Um, <laughs> not two flies walking up a wall. You know, it's that's the culture. That, that's just Aussies, right? That's the way we are. Uh, we enjoy, you know, doing that. Um, as long as it's done you know, responsibly. And look, uh, Flood has spent quite a bit on the RG, on responsible gambling. You know, they, they don't want the top player that could get in trouble because that's not going to help anyone and they don't, don't want to help the player. So you don't want them in the book, really, and you want to understand. And they do spend quite a bit of money trying to make sure that is not occurring. Uh, like the UK last year, they, they handed down a white paper on, you know, trying to change uh, gambling in general to make it a little bit more responsible. And Flutter implemented them before anyone else, even before the white paper was handed down. They basically got a sense, we're going to move to here in responsible gambling. Let's do it now. Why are we waiting? So they moved well ahead of everyone else and they were ready for when the white paper was handed. Their competitors are now trying to implement it, but they've already got the business model ready to go in that market. So they're actually taking quite a bit of share in the UK because of it. That's that sort of, uh, as I said, playing the long game, like looking longer term, investing for years out to where the market's going, where the business will be, rather than what you get in certain companies is a very, you know, two to three years, that's what we're managing it for. I just got my, you know, CEO has to get his EPS so that um, he can get paid his uh, long-term incentive, right, rather than setting business up for years ahead. And it's rare to get management that can do that. Yeah, I'm finding that that's very uh, much a European or Southeast Asian way of thinking about, you know, uh, you know, looking at a business in reverse over 30 years instead of the, you know, quarter by quarter or three years, rip your business apart, I get my paycheck, but then you leave it, the company worse than when you arrived. I'm all for that. Um, so the, the the top 10 holdings in the portfolio, I've just got it here. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's BHP, CBA, Flutter, NAB, Goodman Group, Origin, yep. CSL, and I, IAG, can't pronounce it, La Francais. I say FDJ, Some yeah. French person is going to shoot me for my pronunciation. I apologize. Uh, and Westpac, right? Is that roughly it? They're the, the total, yeah, the biggest sized weights, yeah, in the fund. Is there but anything else the- interesting in there that's not in the top 10 that I can see? Uh, not really. Um, the active weights, we've got uh, IOG in there as well. That's yep. a pretty big position as well. That's uh, done quite well for us. Uh, we talk about, um, I think we'll discuss it maybe later, but, you know, active ownership. Oh, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely get, get into that. Where I was kind of going with this question is, if I'm understanding correctly, you said it's a benchmark product to an extent, but you can pick and choose when you're getting in. If something runs up, it's looking a bit expensive. You, you, you take some off the table and you look for value, right? I do understand that. Um, and why and where I wanted to go back to is back to the two funds and how they're structured because you got one where you can participate um, just, you know, one for one yeah. and then try to beat the index. And then you've got the fun one, which is, you know, uh, you know speak, yeah. to, speak to your advisor. Yeah, speak to your advisor. Yeah. <laughs> speak to your advisor. You got, the, you got the fun one, the geared one, which, um, you know, I have to, should disclose personally used and uh, had a very fun couple of months recently. So um, do you mind giving a bit of colour around how the gearing works, what yeah. is the gearing, because that would be great. So we, uh, at the corporate level, we basically uh, borrow money uh, from an external bank so we can get some pretty competitive rates on the borrowing rates on, on that capital. Uh, and we basically gross up every position two to one. So if you had a million dollars in BHP, then also you got two million uh, and half of that's been funded by the debt. Right, so you, you, as you said, you, you, you're leveraging up the portfolio. So every if the market goes up twenty percent, and hopefully we're outperforming, we're doing our job, and we're beating the market anyway, you're going to get a great at least two x that number all the time. But it works in reverse as well. When the market goes down, uh, uh, you'll get the same impact. It'll be a two x sort of downward. But you know, the, I've I've used the geared fund personally myself because. Over the long run, if you can actually, I don't say you don't want to t- do market timing, but if you think the market's going up on average 8 to 10% a year, that's what it typically does, you're doubling that that exposure over time. So for superannuation, it's fantastic for them because you can get you can jump years ahead in your savings goals in superannuation. But as I said, go to your advisor and get personal advice on that because it can be a rocky ride. Um 
but it well, does. I'm, I'm, sp- I'm speaking from experience here because, like, you're just yeah. disclosing, it was what, March 2020 when everything collapsed, and yeah. um, I think the platform which I had is Generation Life. There's a number of good options yeah. there, but I was looking for something that can give me more, you know, oomph. It wasn't that much of a menu, and we bought it. I only threw like, yeah, a bit at it, uh, you know, for a couple of clients, and I blinked. And that thing was up like 90% or, yeah. or whatever it was. It was outrageous. And then um, recently before Christmas, they're looking at the loans coming into, you know, the election time coming into the announcement. I'm like, hold on a second. I don't, this magnificent seven is dragging everything up. So, look, again, speak to your advisor. You know, some people asset allocate to diversify, et cetera. But this is, you know, a conversation for, you know, people that are a little bit more active that, you know, like to have a look at timing. Um, yeah. I've found it quite a useful uh fund to be able to get something that doesn't have much of a delay on it and then to not just participate in the small uh, upside based on the benchmark but potentially to go over you know if you're right yeah well um i noticed that that period during covid march april low that's when the market was on its lows um you know a lot of the advisors we had inflows into that product it's it's an old product right so it's been around a while. Uh, there's one or two other competitors in the market, um, but it's been around a while. And given our style, because we're look, Perpetual's known for having low beta than the market, but still being able to outperform the market. So we are a lot more uh, conservative in the way we invest. But it doesn't mean that we can't beat the market, even though we're more conservative. Uh, as I said, we run a lower beta than the market most of the time. So what is the beta? The, just the volatility, in, implied volatility of the market. So, oh, no, so apologies, I know what the beta is. I'm just saying, yeah. what is the beta of the fund? Uh, it runs at 0.8 to most sometimes can drop even lower than that during parts of so up to 0.9. So we're going to be a lot lower typically. Uh, so every unit of risk you're taking, you're getting an outsized return typically for that unit. So, and that's just our style because we're, we, we, we pay attention to what you pay for something like the valuations, you know, it's sort of struggle paying stupid multiples for things. So, but sometimes, you know, I would be, you know, fully, full disclosure, you know, from 18 to 19, it was tough for value managers because you were at the right at the end of it, you know, basically 10 year bond yield going down where money was free. You know, when money's free, you can justify pretty much any investment. Uh, and most people did. So when COVID hit and you had, we went from, a, an, as I said to you before, an age of austerity really for 10 years into an age of fiscal dominance where, because of COVID, governments just opened the checkbooks. You know, people getting money sitting at home, remember? So uh, and that, that was spent. It was partly saved, but it was spent. And it got the asset markets flying and, and money started moving. And then we had that, add to that a bit of a bit of a trade war and, you know, supply chain disruptions. And that was brought about this really fast inventory cycle up and down really quickly. So from being very short product to being market venture caught up, but um, but prices adjusted up materially, and I, I don't have to tell you on on the podcast. Inflation was pretty severe, and we are definitely in a cost of living problem. There's a cost of living problem uh, because we're sort of rewiring the global economy at the moment. Globalization's reversing, so that's going to have outsized impacts on the way things work going forward. Um, but with this fund. Uh, you said you're right. I put money into the gig fund around about the same time um, because that's what you try to do. You try to uh, find those periods where things are so extreme that people say you shouldn't be buying equities. Well, that's probably the best time to buy them. You said to be greedy when it's when everyone's fearful. I the use the uh, my, my favourite uh, theoretical thing to lean on is the elastic band. Yeah. I find when <laughs> I find yeah. when uh, you know work politics or you know people's agendas, you know, say you can't invest in coal or whatever it is, and it pushes asset classes to the nth node down a, a particular way. It, it, life's a cycle; it's all going to come back. But the other thing as well is um, you have to be again speak to your advisor because the, you know the geared fund has can be incredibly volatile. Um, uh, but it's also the exact same thing on the other side. You know, when people are way too optimistic, you know, FOMO kicks in, this is never going to stop. Um, you know, it can be volatile, which is the, the why I was very interested to begin the, the conversation at the beginning of this on the basis of it feels like it's a two-stage economy. You have one side where FOMO is ripping 
And the other stage, you know, is just starting to get started or it looks healthier than ever but can't catch a bid. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. What, what do you – yeah, I don't know. It's Anyway, I find it all quite fascinating. Um, so with the third fund, the strategic capital fund, how does, how does that work? So uh, if we take a step back, uh, Give Perpetual has been around a while. You know, it's a 130-odd-plus year company. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the oldest fund in Australia is a, a fund called the Industrial Share Fund. It's over 60 years old, oldest equity fund. That was originally called the Widows and Orphans Fund. Right. So for as a trust business, they decided there's, there's this money sitting here that we should do something about it and try to invest it for the benefit of the widows and orphans of of these trusts, et cetera. And, um, and they've used a very concern. You could imagine because it's inheritance or money passed down to someone, et cetera, they tended to take quite a conservative view on things. And that's sort of like ingrained in the place. Uh, but what we've been through is we tend to uh, get involved when we don't like what we're seeing. Uh, so, you know, we were doing the G part of ESG well before ESG sort of it was considered a thing. Uh, we always didn't like, we, like companies with CEOs, if you can if you can determine what the REM package, if the REM package is in, in favour of all shareholders, that you'll determine, you'll get a... Uh, a behavioural response from the management team, basically if they're incentivised correctly, that will benefit the shareholders, right? Uh, that's the first thing you can do and it's the easiest thing to do. But Perpetual's always been getting in there, getting their hands a little bit dirty. We, sort of, we call it like it's active ownership. We, we don't want to get in there and run the companies like private equity, et cetera. That's not our deal. Uh, but we know when uh, we try to recognise and sometimes it, it does slip by uh, when the wrong behaviour is starting to creep in. Uh, whether it's at, at the board level or in the executive team. Uh, so we will try to nip it in the bud early. Uh, so we've been doing that for a long time, okay, and it's ingrained in everyone in the team. So what we've done is we thought, okay, we've, we've been practising for 40 years, so now we're ready uh, to be to launch a product which focuses more on that. So our portfolio is used to get a little bit of that. You get a couple to 5 to 10% of the portfolio be more of an activist style uh, leaning in to corporates and trying to trying to change the direction of them a little bit uh, because you can get significantly outsized returns when you do that. You can turn it. We always start with it's got to be a quality business, right? It has to be a decent enough business. Right? You don't want to buy something that's in a bad industry and it's a bad operator, right? So can you, you do give that an example stuff. of a business that you've done it with? Well, look, uh, I've got to be very careful what I say. But, oh, fair point. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it ranges from the top 20 all the way down to small caps. You'd think that the, the top, the large caps would be run extremely well. Uh, they are mostly, but occasionally you get the aligning of the planets there where you'll get um, sometimes a chairman that's probably not as acting in the best interest of shareholders or a board which is very complicit. Uh, or a CEO who's um, an imagined team that sort of don't know what they are as a business and think they're trying to change into something they're not. Um, that's very dangerous typically. Uh, so the strategic capital fund is basically, you know, I talked about the the Australian share fund geared funds, like 40-odd stocks. This is basically 10 to 20 stocks, so it's very punchy. <clears throat> but um, pardon me, sorry, mate. Um, but... Um, they have in these these are activist style positions, right? Where um, we can go up to each position, go up to fifteen odd percent plus um, in um, in the fund. So uh, the top three positions will be something we're probably working on actively right now. So we're either engaging the board, sending letters, trying to change. Uh, um, the REM package or asking for a strategic review of the business because they've underperformed for a while and we've noticed there's a behavioural problem in the business uh, or there's a recapitalisation that can occur. So all the, that's, that's a menu of things that can, can occur that you need to, to apply to a business and management and it, inc- it requires early engagement with the board. You, don't, you want to be collaborative if you can. Like if you're going to the board and say, right, this is what's going on with the business, 
uh, this is the work we've done. We feel like this is another path, course of action you should be taking or uh, we feel that the CEO's time's pretty much up and uh, there's no succession planning. We want something to be done about it. Uh, these are all discussions that happen behind closed doors. So 99% of the time, you won't even know what we're doing because we, it's this quiet engagement. And that's the way to do it. You want to be engaged. You want to do engagement and try and get a conversation with the board. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you can reach out to other shareholders to, to talk about things, about trying to not put a bit more reunited front out there. So the, the strategic capital fund is a bit more very stock specific. It's a, purely almost idiosyncratic. It's an ab, sort of a focus on absolute returns rather than versus the benchmark. Uh, and it's got, as I said to you, reasonably um, concentrated positions. But we've got we've done a body of work where we've, when we've done this and we've gotten the necessary changes and uh, response from the company, the returns are significant. And more importantly, rather than have a fund where you get that catalyst, you know, that type of catalyst, and then you get this 30 to 40% re-rating and then you move on, what we've found is you want to hold those businesses for two to three years after that because they actually compound out. They do those returns more frequently, actually, because if you can change the culture in a place and improve it, that, you know, it's the multiplier effect through the business. And the, some of the ones where we've done, like um, uh, Aluka, where we sort of engaged Aluka to try and split the business up into, you know, Deterra, which is the iron ore royalty business, uh, and the Mineral Sands, which was Aluka today, they were together. That was like um, uh, a two-year campaign. Uh, that was a good business, and they were run well and they had a good balance sheet, which is all the things we're looking for. But we felt that the value wasn't being fully recognised in the share price in the market cap of the company. So we engaged them early, it took a bit of time, but eventually uh, they agreed and they split the businesses into two. That was almost like a 100% return when that happened on the combined basis. So you can get outsized returns when you sort of take this activist approach. Uh, so that, that fund is, uh, we only launched late last year and we're going out now and raising some money in it now. Um, it's very different to, like you said, the Australian Share Fund. Or, how much is in the fund now, and what oh, and uh, how much? What's your max? We haven't disclosed it yet, so uh, we're not trying to disclose how much is in it now. But it's well, what it's, I'm trying to work out. What I'm trying to work out by that question, right, is uh, for people that are unfamiliar with you know the strategy that you have, you you, you need a particular um, a percentage of shares in order to sit on the board and have enough of a vote. Right to essentially have any sway. So, what what percentages are you, you know, high, middle, low? What, what percentages are you buying of these companies to essentially get enough, you know, oomph to have these conversations? And, you know, as an example, how big is that check? I suppose they'll give an understanding of you know what, what you're trying to build in this fund. Hmm. Look, firstly, um, I have literally no interest in sitting on boards. <laughs> uh, that's very much more a private equity style of doing things where they take business and they'll stick a, people, a couple of people on the board, et cetera. But we'll, we'll suggest directors to go on the board though, right? We'll try and change the director mix if we can and improve the, the director mix uh, with relevant, you know, relevant industry uh, uh, inf uh, experience, et cetera. So we're not going down that road because that's, I'd rather to have a bit more of an arm's length to that point. But if you put enough smart people in a situation, they will work it out. In a, as a group, right? So don't forget, we also manage 12 and a half odd billion across the, the other funds. There's another, another nine other strategies. And typically, some of the active strategies we have are already owned across the group, perpetual group, as in, sorry, perpetual asset management, our, our business, perpetual Australia. So we'll have those positions anyway, and we'll own between, in large caps, a couple of percent, which doesn't sound like a lot. But they, what I find is the large caps are actually quite responsive. They don't want to have... Um, you know, the 25% no rule on the REM, the REM package. So if the remuneration package gets two strikes against, so it gets voted against by the shareholders once and then the second time, there's a board spill. So no one wants to go down that path, as in large companies. And even if it's a high vote, not 25, but it gets up there to 12, they will tend to not, that's something, they should, they should recognise something's wrong if they're getting that. Um, but we'll own up to 15% of companies. Typically, so we do. Um, we do have a bit of weight when we need to, and you will need to get at least five percent plus. I feel typically, 
in companies to have a bit of an impact. And that's why sometimes even with the large caps, we reach out to other shareholders who might have uh, a, common, a, a similar belief to what we believe, which is there's problems in the business, we need to change it. Um, and, and that can be, again, you, you out, you're multiplying your, your, your outcome then when that happens. All right, so uh, the fund itself will ha- own a particular amount, then you pull together what's all in Perpetual's coffers and then mm. you seek allies Yeah, to build your position. We can do that. We can go on our own a lot of times. If you've got plus 10% or 7 to 10%, you're going to have, sorry, 5 to 10%. You're going to get a you're gonna get a hearing from the, the board, definitely. Look, and the, for us also, with respect, it has to be done in a certain way. You've got to approach them and suggest, look, we've done this, we've done the work and this is what we think. Set us right. Set us right if we're incorrect. It's interesting you're discussing remuneration. Would you say that you know uh, to change the behaviour and the direction of a company, besides uh, you know doing an asset split like the other scenario, is uh, determining how people get remunerated? In your opinion, probably one of the best ways to make change in a company. It's probably the only way to make change in a company. Because let's face it, look, people that get to that position, the senior manager, are pretty pretty smart operators. Typically, they're quite good what they do. Um, and if you put the right incentive package in front of them, they'll typically try and achieve it, which is good for the shareholders, right? So all you've got to make sure is that that remuneration package correlates with shareholders winning out of that, their behaviour, like making, improving the returns of the business or whatever if you have to ask them to do a strategic review, they get paid to do that if it's in the best interest of shareholders. It is the, the easiest way to get return out of a business. And look, we've looked at REM packages and we look, we rate all of them. So we look at all the companies in our universe, quality universe, and we rate the remuneration packages and there's some absolute howlers out there. It's just funny we're having this conversation uh, and I'll give you a bit of context. Like I have this conversation practically on a weekly basis or a monthly basis with my sister. My sister's head of remuneration for Sydney Water. Yeah. So it's just funny you're talking about how dictating behaviours and but the other thing which she says is quite interesting is you might make a change at a board level or you know at the management level. But then what happens when you have parts of the business that are kind of like isolated and then you have a manager that thinks that they can make a change and then dictate in their own terms and then the backlash from that it's just it's, it's, it's an entire little ecosystem but you can drive change from one particular source and nudge behaviors and yeah i think it's very i hear it all the time but i'm having i'm asking these questions because a lot of people might not be familiar with you know how remuneration can really drive behaviors and then essentially dictate how the company is going to perform there is, if you can get it down to the shop floor, but you have to make it, what we've noticed, you can make it really transparent to the people on the shop floor that if you do X, you will get paid extra, right? And people, you know, are aspirational at heart. They want to do well for themselves and their family, right? So if you can get it down to the shop floor, whether they can, you know, it's, it's going to be tied to productivity, right? That's, in the end of the day, that's what we need. And there's been, we're in negative productivity sort of situation for years now, right? So. Um, there are plenty of companies I know of that have, have driven that change through the shop floor and they've got outsized benefits out of it. The shelter's has done extremely well and so have the people on the shop floor. They've got paid, you know, one to two X of what they traditionally would have made. One of the other interesting things she always says is that if you can't write someone's remuneration on the back of a, you know, napkin, then it's just way too complicated. If they can't understand it and they can't tell it in an elevator, then, you know, why would they potentially go for it? It's like it's an art of like it's it's crazy, but you know people just kind of get confused and they lose sight of it and they just kind of forget and then it becomes a bureaucracy and you know I'm just happy to turn up every single day to get my check. Well, the dangerous part is where they add these intangible aspects to a remuneration package. I I, I think most people respond to numbers. If you say if we can get output up by X, you will get Y. Simple. Not and then you must behave a certain way. Like people should behave correctly in the workplace, right? But when you're trying to change, when we're talking behaviour, not that behaviour, we want them to be act professionally in their job, in their job and really care about the, the quality of the work they do. And if they do that and they ex- hit the numbers that we require, they'll do okay. And it has to stream through. the Like the best companies we've ever invested in have from the shop floor up, 
they all benefit from improved uh, the improved economics of the business, right? Um, and they are the ones that tend to compound returns for decades. And it's like a it's, it's a it's a it's a culture in the business where they the man on the on the, on the shop floor and the, or the woman on the shop floor they know they'll get paid an extra two thousand dollars for the six months, which can make a difference to someone, right? Or more than that, um, if they achieve their objectives, and more importantly, that no matter what else happens at the corporate level, they get paid that number. There can't be this clawback stuff. Because the the senior manager done a bad job somewhere else, you can't allow that to affect the man on the on the shop floor. You got to pay. You got to pay for excellence. I know this is quite sensitive, but you said you've done this a number of times. You know, in the past, is there any companies where you can give examples that you know you can discuss? Or uh, we've we've talked about one or two in the past. Uh, back in the day, we had a, a pretty large position in Blue Scope still. And uh, they had, you know, a decade of still industry is not an easy industry. It's quite a tough business. Uh, you think about, you know, who you're competing with, you've got to be in tons of steel capacity in China and North Asia. Um, so that's, you know, being exported and depressing prices, et cetera. Now we've got tariffs on everything. So you can't, uh, it's a lot harder to do that. But uh, Port Kembla, which is one of their biggest assets, Blue Scope, it's a blast furnace, so it's over 2 million tons of steel, et cetera. Uh, don't forget they own the Colorbond business, a great business in Australia. But the the workflow and the work, uh, the productivity in that plant was quite poor and it was based on very old work conditions, like ages old, and they're losing $200 million a year making steel, right, which is not, not the best outcome for shareholders or the employees, really. You don't want to run a business which is losing money because your job's at, at risk the whole time. Um, and we we... Look, whether I don't think it was our idea because we sort of thought you've got to change that. Um, and obviously you've got to either restructure the business or shut it down. And it's dangerous talk, right? You are talking about this fourth significant amount of people that work in that plant, but you can't keep writing checks, losing money. Uh, but you, what we had was we were fortunate that at that time when we approached the board, we said, look, look, let's change the REM structure, the REM structure for the the management team make it longer term rather than short term incentive, like it a, lo- a proper long term incentive. And if they do X and Y, we're going to, the shelter is going to benefit, the, the employees will definitely benefit, right? Because it's going to be a more profitable business. Okay. And you'll get this enormous outsized return. And we're happy to write a check to the management team for that. No problem. Fortunately, we had a good board there. They recognized that and they were well down the path of doing it. They wanted a supportive shareholder, I suspect. But, um, and, and and we had a good CEO and management team. Paul O'Malley was the CEO at the time. We had some good deputies in there like uh, Tanya and, and Mark Vassella, who's now the CEO. Uh, and they um, they just modernised the work practices down the plant and they went from losing 200 to making 200 plus, right? In what time frame? A couple of years. That's a material value addition to the business. Like the stock is That's huge. It, it's triple. The stock triple on the back of it. So as a shareholder, you should be will, more than happy to write a check for that behaviour, that performance. More importantly, though, the management team made sure that the people on the shop floor got paid for, for productivity, right? So now it's a fantastic business. It's a great asset down there, right? And that's changed the very nature of that business. So um, I'd say it's not all us. I'd definitely say it's not all us. But you had a compliant, like a board that was willing to take the risk because you are taking a risk there, right? You're basically saying, well, we can't operate like this. We might have to shut the plant and just import hot roll coil. It's basically HRC from North Asia to make Colorbond because this is it's you can't lose that much money for that long. And then uh, had a management team that was actually um, willing to execute on the plan and to look longer term to make those changes. Uh, and they had a decent balance sheet as well at the time because it was going to be rocky to do that. You're going to have some mistakes. So it was. Um, it's the best example, from what I feel, of a change in culture at the top. They're willing to make that that change, to make a stru- structural change to the business, and you got a again they proved up the case. It was a three times type outcome for the, on the share price because of it over a few years. And that's a steel company, right? Not a tech company, nothing like that. It's a steel company, and today they're a fantastic business still, Blue Scope. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember I remember the story. I remember investing in it. I remember the, that entire thing play out, but I just didn't realize um, how effectively remuneration it, from the ground floor up um, mm. you know, played a part in that. Do you, uh, you mentioned uh, you know, tech uh, as well. Uh, is there an example you have of like a SaaS business or a tech business or a service-based business? Because that's completely different to like <laughs> a factory floor with... Yep. A bit harder with that. Um, cause the, um, you know, the capital goes up and down the elevator every day. It's the people business, Fair but point. it's usually, uh, with tech's a bit harder. It's, it's, it's an intangible. It doesn't thing. have to be tech. I'm just yeah. thinking like something that's not essentially like a factory because a factory makes a lot of sense to myself. Mm. Um, probably to a lot of people well, that have had family we, members work at these places or something. Yeah, look, um, IOG is one that we've been involved in for a while, the last few years. Obviously, you know, the insurance sector had a tough time of it. You had um, La Nina, you had, had significant water. Like insurance don't like rain, particularly in built-up areas because it tends to do more damage than, I hate to say it, but when it's dry, um, it's a lot better for claims because um, they had to cope with that, like significantly heavy rain events and and, and kept catastrophes, um, severe weather. Plus during COVID, remember, we ran out of parts. You couldn't get a car, you couldn't buy a car. So the replacement cost went vertical. So inflation was like 3x in in, in uh, home and motor, right? So they had to deal with inflation and they had to, with premium pricing, it's, it's it catches it has to catch up. If they haven't priced for the risk initially, the pricing is always catching up. And, and IOG is uh, a, an excellent business in a very good industry where basically it's Suncorp and IOG. There's a couple of internationals there as well. Short tail insurance, right? So it's basically home and motor policies. It's not life insurance and stuff like that, which is very long tail. Uh, and they, uh, that's all about, um, it's, an, it's an intangible service. It's, they're selling a, a policy. What is it? You're not buying a piece of steel or whatever you buy or a brick, you're buying a, um, a policy that is going to cover you in, in a downside scenario. So that's, and it's an older business. It's been around a long time. Uh, and sometimes cap allocation is quite poor in these sort of businesses. And for us, it was, we uh, engaged early with the board of IAG because we we're fearful they're going to um, buy something, right? And uh, you typically, most of these deals aren't great, not just insurance, but in general. Any sort of deal to buy another business, you have to have flawless timing. You have to do it at the worst. Like we talked about being greedy when everyone's fearful. Most companies don't do that. They do the reverse. So um, they get nervous at the bottom and they don't want to do anything. So the great companies always have great balance sheets. So when things are terrible, they can swing for the fences on something, take out a competitor, all that stuff, and then you know they're paying the lows. So IAG had just uh, had to tighten up their capital um, allocation policy. So we engaged the the board, and fortunately, uh, the chairman of the board actually uh, responded quite positively to what we were telling them, and um, they sort of walked away from the transaction. Um, which is quite positive because I thought, would have thought it destroyed value. And ever since that point where they've shown the market, this is a bit different, they've shown the market some discipline around capital allocation, how they spend, they use their, um, how they're going to invest the excess capital in the business, the market slowly re-rated them and it's outperformed the market for the last 18 months. That's a bit different and a different approach because you're trying to tell them not to do something. Uh, or if you're going to do something, make sure you're not paying that price. They're a bit more mm. With the way you approach uh, transactions, look, ninety nine percent of most M and A doesn't really work. When you in those conversations, did you point out QBE's failures? <laughs> like it, it, this is exactly what QBE plus. did, and look where it is now. They're still suffering those legacy deals. Yeah, they're, they're, they're suffering legacy. Whereas, but going forward, they're a much better business though because they have got that, that corporate memory. Look, we don't own QBE, um, but they're on the they're on a journey to sort of like sort themselves out. Uh, and that's the thing is this corporate memory. Um, when things are going well, 
what typically happens is uh, our favourite uh, people in the world, investment bankers, will show up at the door with a, a hot deal and um, if you don't have enough um, experience on the board that have seen this before, uh, they can say no, leave the room type thing, please. Uh, they will typically get down a path because most companies, companies want to grow, right? They want to get bigger. But there's no point. The, the suffering that you can in, in, uh, inflict on your, basically, your shareholders from a bad deal lasts for years. It lasts for years, right? Um, I always tell people, look at the share count of companies going through time. Because uh, if, if they're willing to issue equity all the time, they're telling you what they think the value of the equity is because they're happy to just give it away, right? So that's a good rule to look at. Some of the best companies in the world have issued equity once and that's pretty much it. And what they do is actually then spend the next 20 years shrinking the equity base by sh- shrinking mm. the pairs on issue, right? And they, they're more focused on investing in the customer, they're, they're the, the people in the business to get them better and make sure they're high, high service levels, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and invest their capital internally wisely so that they're compounding the returns on the business over a very long period and allows you to buy back more stock. Right? And then you look at some of these charts like AutoZone in the US where they've just the share counts has gone down the whole time. They're like seven baggers, those things. And that's auto parts retailing. It doesn't have to be a tech company to get those returns. And that's again, that starts at the top. Board management and the right incentive structure. And people that's also the trend the game, sorry. Skin in the game as well. Sorry, they have to have skin in the game. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yes, yeah, skin <laughs> in the game. I was just gonna say it's also the trend in the past number of years where companies have stayed um private for longer for exactly this reason. Yeah, to essentially make themselves look better, and not getting you know caught. <laughs> Whole another conversation. Um, but one question I did want to ask, you know, with with Outlook, um, if this is something you're actually exploring right now, it's okay. We don't have to discuss it. But you mentioned insurance. Um, do you have a lot of the portfolio that looks at health insurance? And where I'm going with this is, I can't go to a barbecue these days. I even had a you know colleague. I uh, use these weight loss drugs from um, Azempic, uh, you know, Nova Nordis, you know, Eli Lilly. Uh, people are losing substantial amounts. It's just a diabetes drug, right? But now it's coming commonplace. And a comment which I heard yesterday was, sorry, don't quote me, I can't remember the number. Um, but if the US or Australia allow these weight loss drugs to essentially become part and parcel in, in the um Health insurance, like they pay for it, you know, potentially the US can go bankrupt. <laughs> it's apparently it's something ridiculous, like, you know, if the market picks up over in the States, you know, become like a $150 billion business. Uh, and and where, where I'm also seeing the pattern is for the past 12 months, we've seen companies like ResMed, CSL, which is, you know, the portfolio, a number of these companies pull back because the people are saying that, you know, if this weight loss occurs, you know, there might be 20% less obese people and then those people might not be, you know, using other products, you know, down the journey. And since you mentioned insurance, um, it's just a question that's been running around in my mind, which is, uh, you know, is this entire industry going to change? And then again, with remuneration, you know, how do you, I don't know, how do you deal with the numbers on that? It's, yeah. It's interesting how we ended up here, but it was just, <laughs> you said a number of things that just made me curious if you knew the answer or, or you had an opinion um, on it. Don't know the answer, but uh, <laughs> I've got to find an opinion on that. Um, yeah, look, I think with these weight loss drugs, they're they're used for di- as I said for diabetes first. Um, what happens if you're on them for a long time and you're doing it for weight loss and you're technically sort of what happens then? Right, so you need some long-term studies, and don't forget also that they, they'll probably get better. The drugs will get better, so the the, the pharmaceutical companies will spend more in R and D to try and improve less side effects. But you're right; they've created a whole new industry, right? Um, and it does sort of if people are healthier, it's not not great for, for the drug industry itself that sell, sells products which are there once you get a problem. If you sort of like, if this is a preventative sort of measure, a measure. Um, it does change market dynamics. For health insurance, initially it's probably probably pretty good, actually. Less claims. 
So claims claims expenses are not high, not growing a lot. People are still paying their premiums. Um, I guess the problem in the longer run, though, is if people are healthier, do you need private health insurance? Just to put it put it out there. Um, obviously, the tax system forces you if you earn a certain amount. So, yeah, tax. Um, I was just about to say, I had a friend that did that. And it's like, hold on a second, I'm still paying you know, yes. the 1% of my salary anyway, like, you know, and then if I had to go get my health insurance back, it's going to cost me more money. Like yeah. the entire exercise was lost in money in the end. Yeah. So, but obviously you, there is that uh, peace of mind when you're getting health insurance that if something goes wrong, you can get treated pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> but it, look, there's epic thing uh, swept through and it affected, you know, for anything from QSR, quick serve restaurants type uh, fast food to drug companies and, um, is it covered? Is that it, uh, is that covered by government rebates, or is it purely have to pay for it out of your own pocket? It does. I think if you're a diabetic, it might be. I, I, don't quote me on that. But if you're if you're it's being if you're being put on it for di- for diabetic because you have a diabetic condition, I think it might be covered. But I'm not too sure about weight loss. Well, this is interesting, right? And this is why I'm, it's so fascinating because a lot of the community these days, we're having a lot of foods that are essentially horrendous for you, you know, seed oils, all these things that, you know, you know, corn-based, you know, I don't want to get started, but there's all these things that are essentially creating a dietary problem that are fine and allowed to happen because you're going to cover empty by beware. But then you have the launch of a product that generally knocks off 20 to 25% of people's weight, makes them actually genuinely healthy. And now there's an actual argument or a conversation happening on whether or not the government should pay for a drug which nearly so many people can use that could potentially drop the entire obesity in Australia, but like, you know, in double percentages. And the question is, if the government funds this, it will completely the amount of money that they're going to spend on this is out is going to be huge. And can they afford it? But the thing is, if they don't do it, then what's the point of even having them existing? Because isn't it for health? Like they're talking about the knock-ons effects. Like you know, there's less risk of of heart attacks. Of you know, anyway, I just I'm just curious because you're closest to the coalface on this particular you know in in the insurance space, as you mentioned before. I'm well, just curious to hear what you're thinking about it. Right, that's what markets. Yeah. the markets will give you part of the information, and then they'll try and extrapolate. So you'll get part of the information you'll extrapolate. You'll try and look, the market try and look forward. And they sort of did that with the equity of certain companies, right? Like Resmond fell quite a bit, so it didn't, maybe didn't move because of, of Ozempi, but a lot of drug, com- drug companies that were selling statins and stuff like that, they moved because of it. That's what the market does. It looks forwards and discounts. And every time there's a piece of information that comes in, they'll make an assessment of it, right? The market's reasonably efficient at doing that most of the time. Other times they lose their minds, so um, it's hard to it's hard to be very definitive about it. I just tend to react to look. I look at what the equity is pricing in. I, I always bring it back to what the stock's worth. What's what's the market paying for it? Is it are they paying? Is it is it overly discounted, which it can happen? Like market will always overly uh, put too much of a premium on things always, and they'll overly discount bad news that are a string of bad news. So. I always work it back to, I don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. I always back, back back to what's the company worth? Does it fundamentally change the value of this business? If it's trading at a big enough discount, I should be buying it. And st- sticking with that and trying not to worry about um, government policy and those things, that's always in the mix. Like all that, that's all information that goes into the hopper, right, for the market to work on. And so all I have to do is work out, okay, what's the, what's the symmetry of that risk? And the probability of it having a significant impact on the business, and what's my upside downside from here? Where I'm, what, what am I paying for today? Is there thirty to fifty percent upside versus fifteen percent downside? I should probably have a bit of this in the portfolio. Yes, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, and like you do, you do have a point, right? You know, pie in the sky. It's nice to uh, you know chew the fat over these things over a barbecue, but in reality, you know, what are we dealing with today? <laughs> I believe I, I think I put up a, a quote recently. Um, I can't remember his name, uh, but the comment was: uh, "Investors sell to op- optimists um, and buy from pessimists." So it's good to you know see a market where you know it's pessimistic because. Well, that was you know, COVID. Anyway. Right? That was March to April. Yeah. It was just complete 
pessimism, like nothing was – the world was over, right? And you could – everything – almost 95% of the market was on sale. You had a couple of stocks that did well, like the Woolies and the drug companies held up quite well during that period, that initial period of COVID for obvious reasons, but everything else was on sale. Like even REITs, which were, you know, had a tough time post uh, GFC, were trading at such material discounts and they still are, some are still today. You uh, mentioned Woolworths and I wouldn't mind uh, just touching on this quickly. Um the price, pricing situation with COVID, the so-called inflation that saw a huge amount of price gouging, um, just from a valuation standpoint, do you think the Australians have a reason to be you know, upset? Was there actually price gouging or was that genuine uh, you know, inflation? I'm just asking, you know, what, what happened there? I don't, I don't, I don't want to preempt the – I don't want to be called down to Canberra to, to be a witness for something, but – Right, uh, I understand. That's, that's, no, but I'm just, just, I'm just joking there. Look, I look at what margins they get, the super, supermarkets. They get between 5 and 6% EBA margins, not 50, right? So um, they are a pass-through business. And it's, it's, a fine, it's a fine line, right, because they want to make sure the prices are good for consumers, yeah? Uh, but then they have to sort of negotiate hard with some of the suppliers so that they can get that price. Okay, so they're in the middle. They're a distributor, effectively. Um, and it's a hard thing to balance, but they're not making 30% EBIT margins, right? They're doing 5 to 6% on average, and it's been like that for a long time. And if it goes lower than that, these businesses will struggle to survive. It's, it's a tough business then. Um, outside of the significant reinvestment they make in logistics, to get, you know, food from point A to point B, cold chain logistics. There's a lot of capital invested in these businesses, right? Uh, so whether they're price gouging, that's very hard. I, I think it will be very hard to prove. Maybe I, maybe remove hard, the, the word gouging thing. from a political sense. I was just more yeah. curious as in do you think, uh, yeah, the, the, as you said, the business, they have the cost, they're just operating generally as a business or I'm just wondering do you think Australians have, you know, a leg to stand on with, you know, how they feel when, you know, when something used to cost 50 bucks, now it's 120 for the same items. I think you got to, if you step back and look at the, the picture in totality, things have changed globally. Supply chains are very different, right? The way things are moving from point A to point B is very different. We're doing a lot more, you know, China was the base for everything. Now it's not so. A lot more um, Europeans are doing more on, they're trying to onshore, so they're doing more in Eastern Europe which means you, if you were in Eastern Europe before COVID because it was cheaper, uh, you're probably being forced out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so supply chains are, are changing. When it becomes less efficient, it's more expensive. That's going to get in the price somehow. Um, all other things, so fuel, energy, you know, our, our electricity prices are up 2.5x compared to pre-COVID. So you think about that, that, you know, businesses need electricity as well. That factors into their cost of business, doing business. So all these things go in and then they they charge, there's a margin on top of that. If the government was, to come, you know, if people want to come out and say they can't make that margin, well, <laughs> you may be prepared for the consequences of that. Is the capital will be withdrawn from the industry? Right? And that well, makes it even less efficient. So you can, it is a bit of a <laughs> let's... You're dealing with a proper Pandora's box. It's hard to prove. I don't know. I think it'll be difficult to prove gouging. That's why I think probably the best thing is to discuss the gouging side. I was just curious, or you know, people are feeling pressure at the the checkout compared to you know how well the companies are doing. But, well, that, um, that is definitely the case, though. That is definitely the case. But that's across a lot of things, right? Well, that's what concerns Australians. So, what I'd like to finish on is what keeps you up at night and what gets you out of bed in the morning. Everything keeps me up at night. An investor, as an equity investors, worry about everything at all times. So you're always you're always thinking about your portfolio, right? The risks inherent in your portfolio. You know the the one percent risks in the portfolio, which are only one percent, but can can they become worse? <clears throat> and you're always constantly weighing up the the prospective return versus the risk you're taking today for that return, right? 
you, you've got to take significant risk to make significant returns. But sometimes you can uh, lower the negative outcomes by doing some decent work, research, to really understand the risks and actually uh, lower the probability. Like you'll have a better understanding that the probability actually is a lot lower than you think of that risk occurring, which means we're getting a very cheap, cheap company with significant upside. That's the whole game is to constantly just on your the one you're long the ones you're long just make sure you understand it and don't fall into the old traps of you know confirmation bias and you know recency bias all that sort of stuff where it can happen it's I, you, you, everyone's a human being so you always slip down that road occasionally you just got to pull yourself out occasionally step back and go hang on a sec what's the what's the antithesis to this thesis that we have. Yeah, this conversation has been very fascinating. If anyone wants to learn more about yourself or Perpetual or these particular funds, um, how can they find you? Go to the Perpetual uh, website, um, so perpetual.com.au. There's all our products are up there. All the PDFs and PDFs are there. Um, <clears throat> or speak to your advisor. Actually, we've been around long enough. Most advisors know who we are. That they do. That they do indeed. Well, Vince has been. <laughs> It's been brilliant having you on and I really appreciate um, your insights and, you know, how you think about markets. So um, I hope you have a great day. Thanks, man. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Take it easy. Cheers, mate. Any views expressed in this recording do not represent the view of any other third party and are the sole personal opinions of the speaker. Any reference to financial product does not constitute advice or recommendation, and before any action, you should seek proper advice from your financial professional. Australian listeners should head to www.moneysmart.gov.au to find more information on obtaining financial advice. To get in touch with York, head to our website, www.yorkwealth.com.au.